Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the memory systems course. Uh, we're getting started a little bit late and we already have a lot of material to cover, so hopefully you're ready for it. <laughs> but it's going to be fun. Uh, I was here five years ago and I was talking about memory systems again. I'm going to talk about memory systems again this time. There will be some overlap with five years. Who was here five years ago? Okay, no one, that's good. So I can talk about the same things and it'll be okay. <laughs> no, I won't do that. Memory systems is an area that keeps growing and growing and growing and there's a lot more to do. And hopefully by the end of these five days, you'll be convinced that everybody in the world should be working on memory systems and stop doing processing. I'm just kidding, of course, but I think we need more people working on memory systems for sure because it's such a big bottleneck today in today's systems. And it's, I think, in general, overlooked in many cases. And we will discuss some of these reasons why it has been overlooked because of our obsession with computation. But I think today we're, uh, we're beyond computation. We know how to do computation really, really well. We can optimize it. We can build all, of, all sorts of accelerators. Accelerators are not a problem, in my opinion. But the memory, how to feed the data, how to get data into the accelerators is a huge problem. And this course is about basically that, how to actually design the memory system and uh, what are the trends and basics. So I will start with the trends and basics. If you have the uh, handouts, you will see that there are a lot of slides. We may skip a lot of them, but they're there for your benefit. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I may defer the answer for later, given that we don't have a lot of time, uh, but we can certainly uh, interact a lot over the next five days while I'm over here. I'd be happy to get to know all of you. Actually, one good task would be uh, for you guys to introduce yourselves to me. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk with anyone on anything. Okay, uh, let me very quickly start uh, over here. Uh, I'm trying to avoid this light, it's very uh, bright. Uh, basically, a lot of you know me probably, but I'm at ETH Zurich for a few years now. Uh, I also have a position at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, I, I, I work a lot with industry. I started the computer architecture group at Microsoft Research after I finished my PhD, and then we work a lot with Intel and AMD and recently I spent time at Google and VMware also. And we do have a lot of collaborations with industry. Uh, and actually, uh, these talks, uh, the, this, this course is uh, based on the courses that I've delivered in industry as well as uh, academia for a while. Uh, if you want to reach me, my Gmail address is the best. You can use my ETH address also, that's fine. Uh, and uh, you can see my webpage. I do research and teaching in computer architecture, hardware security, bioinformatics, computing platforms, a lot of things over here. And we're going to touch upon a lot of things, maybe very little on some things. These are some of the areas that we're looking at. Uh, I'm going to go down, this is too high. Uh, basically, we're going to touch upon a lot of things over here. Uh, computer architecture is the main focus, hardware, software, interaction, bioinformatics. I'm going to start with that, actually. I think that's very exciting. And we're going to talk about security in a later lecture. Uh, our focus will be memory and storage, especially DRAM. We'll talk a little bit about flash. I'm not going to talk about emerging memory technologies this time. That was a good subject five years ago. You can look at the slides. And we still do a lot of work, but there's just not enough time uh, within uh, the course of five, uh, five days. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the very uh, exciting interaction of hardware security, energy efficiency, fault tolerance, and performance today. Today, you can trade off these things with each other. And uh, today, there's a very interesting interaction as technology scales down to smaller technology nodes you will see that uh, the interaction will become even more stringent. And we'll talk about that, especially toward the end of the course. Uh, but you will see uh, examples of it. We're going to talk a lot about system architecture interaction, new execution models like processing in memory. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and new interfaces that are needed to enable some of these new execution models, interfaces both at the hardware level as well as the software levels. Uh, clearly, we're not going to be able to cover everything, but there's a lot to do over here. And everything we talk about will be heterogeneous and parallel, actually. We're going to uh, not talk about GPUs as much, but uh, you will see that the G uh, memory bottleneck exists everywhere regardless. And heterogeneity, is, uh, heterogeneity inside the memory is one way of solving it also. So we're certainly going to talk about systems for data analytics. But as I said, I'll uh, start with genome sequence analysis and uh, assembly algorithms to motivate. Uh, so before I do that, uh, these are some of the things that we're going to cover. These are also aligned with uh, the things that we're uh, examining in my research group. Uh, fundamentally secure, reliable, safe architectures. We're going to spend a lot of time, and hopefully that will become clear why. 
because we're having a lot of scaling issues, especially in memory, that is affecting reliability, safety, and security. Energy efficiency, clearly, I don't need to harp on that. That's clearly important, and we're going to talk about several solutions to that. And we're going to talk a lot about low latency, uh, which is a topic that has been ignored a lot, uh, in my opinion, in system design in general, but memory system design in particular. But if, if you actually focus on latency and lowering latency, everything else in the system design becomes much, much better. Of course, latency is a difficult thing to optimize for, but we're going to talk about some fundamental ideas related to that. And this is an, another thing that I'm really excited about, architectures for genomics, medicine, and health. And we've been looking at this for a while. I'm going to start with this, and I, I'll, I call this a motivating detour. This is really uh, an application that is demanding, that's going to demand a lot more from the memory system going forward. And I think this is one of the future applications that is going to change the world significantly. And I'm going to focus on a very small aspect of genomics, medicine, and health. There are a lot more uh, in this space uh, that will uh, change the world. So uh, I'll, I'll give you the story very quickly. Uh, uh, the, the, the way I got into bioinformatics was uh, through a friend, actually. He was at the University of Washington Genomics Department, and we were doing a hike at Mount Rainier, close to Seattle one day, and we were discussing, oh, can you do something like this, basically? We were discussing the state of the art in uh, genome analysis, and it was taking weeks and weeks to do an analysis, even on a data center, uh, especially if you want to be comprehensive. And we want to say, oh, why don't we build a device that could actually analyze someone's genome? Basically, a doctor takes this device, uh, sequences someone's genome, gives it a query, and the device replies within a minute saying, oh, you should use this drug versus that drug. OK, you can uh, have many, many other queries, of course. Clearly, this was a dream. This was 2007 at that time. Uh, at that time, we didn't even have genome sequencers that were embedded, that could have been embedded. Today, we do, actually. That's why this is exciting. Believing in the technology is very good. I should be farther away from this. There's some ringing. OK. Uh, and then we started working a lot on the genomics. Uh, I'm going to give you very quickly uh, aspects of it. For what's a genome made of? What is the problem, really? Uh, if you look at a genome, it has these A, C, T, G, uh, a different basis, and you would like to understand uh, what a genome is made of uh, by basically figuring out the sequence of ACTGs, if you think about your biology 101, or molecular biology 101, uh, you would like to figure out what a genome uh, consists of, or the, the sequence of ACTGs. Basically, the goal is to find a complete sequence of ACTGs in someone's DNA. It, it doesn't have to be someone, it could be a virus, right? It could be some animal. The challenge is there is no machine that we have today that takes long DNA as input and gives the entire sequence as output. And that makes this a comp huge computational challenge. Why? Because all sequencing machines chop up the DNA into pieces and try to identify relatively small pieces. But they do not tell you how these pieces fit together. They tell you, oh, I have this little piece, 300 base pairs, and this 300 base pairs also, 300 base pairs. And now your problem, computational problem, is to solve the puzzle. How do these fit together to form a 3.2 billion base pair genome? And I, I, I like this analogy of uh, likening it to uh, yarn balls. You have these yarn balls, and you need to untangle them. But there's no way to untangle a single yarn ball. You basically chop all of them together, and you need to figure out where these uh, different pieces that you chopped actually map to. And these are the choppers that we use today. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the most state-of-the-art ones, Illum Illuminas. It's about $3 million. Uh, and uh, when we started, this, uh, this thing didn't exist. This is an embedded device right now. Oxford Nanopore Technologies has this device. And this is getting us closer to the reality. So I think one important lesson that I would like to uh, tell everyone is believe in the technology. Technology is going some one way. If you actually anticipate the trends of the technology, you can do a lot better. And I think it's clear that we're going to go see more and more machines like this going forward. So why is this interesting? Basically, uh, the, everything started with the Human Genome Project everything like that, at least practical. And uh, this project uh, wanted to sequence a s full human genome. It took a long time, as you can see, 13 years long, and probably it, was, it cost more than this, actually. Uh, but now we have a somewhat of a complete uh, genome sequence, uh, human genome sequencing. And the uh, new technologies, those machines that you saw, uh, are high, called high-throughput sequencing technologies. And they've enabled a lot more development after that, basically. These new technologies were introduced around 2007 or so. If you cannot see this, this is years over here. And this is the cost per row megabase of DNA sequence. So cost of DNA sequencing has reduced greatly. And this trend line over here is the Moore's law. So it's actually the cost, uh, Moore's law actually, the cost uh, thing, basically the cost of the transistor is reducing right over time. 
but the cost of genome sequencing is reducing much faster, as you can see over here. That's why we were able to sequence a lot more genomes. But the problem is, uh, we're able to do this really well today, but we're not able to do this really well. Basically, you have these little pieces, you need to map them to a reference genome to understand what's the length of the full genome. But this takes a lot of time, and this enables uh, later, uh, for example, now you can ask the question, how, how is my little gene different from this other gene? Or how is my little gene interacting uh, with this particular drug or not? Uh, so you have to do this step. And after that, there's scientific discovery that can come about, there's a lot of medical improvement. So one example question is, uh, this is more scientific, if, you, if I give you a bunch of sequences from potentially different species or people, uh, you can figure out uh, where they are the same and where they are different. This could be useful for many purposes, right? Even though you may not know the application today, 20 years later someone can, can come up with an application. Uh, and this is another example, these are different uh, species over here. Uh, how do you actually find out their, uh, 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 where they're similar, where they're different? And this is another example, it's my favorite example. Humans are so, so similar to each other except they're so different, right? <laughs> And you can put any of your favorite politicians over here, I guess. Uh, yeah, and that's the human and banana similarity. <laughs> okay, so there are a bunch of other questions. This is uh, another of them. Given a bunch of short sequences, can you identify the approximate species cluster for a genomically unknown organism? Can you actually come up with an assembly of uh, an unknown uh, genome? Can you come up with a sequence? There are a lot of graph algorithms that are involved here. We're not going to talk about the algorithms, bioinformatics algorithms, but if you're interested, you can take a look at some of these references over here. So basically, the point is we're bottlenecked in mapping. We know how to do this really well today, maybe not perfectly, but our computational problem is huge. We can sequence things fast, but we're not able to uh, analyze things fast enough. And that's the bottleneck illustrated in some other way. So that's what we wanted to actually uh, solve. And this turns out to be a very memory bound problem that I'm going to motivate that a little bit more. Basically, let me go into the problem a little bit more because it's, it's, uh, this is a course and it's good to always understand the applications that are really driving the requirements from the system. Uh, so read mapping, basically you have these many short DNA fragments, short meaning 50 to 300 base pairs, and put it into context, DNA is 3.2 billion base pairs. And you want to map this to a reference genome with some minor differences a lot. So DNA logically looks like this, physically it looks like this. You chop it into pieces, you don't know how it logically looks like, so you try to map these little pieces to a reference genome that you know of and reconstruct what this DNA logically looks like, hopefully. And also figure out what are the differences from the reference genome. So this is a hard problem, this is called the read mapping problem. And it's hard because reads are relatively short. We're going to talk about long reads later on. But even if the leads are, reads are 10,000 long, this is still a computationally uh, hard problem. So what are the challenges? You need to find the mappings of every read. A short read may map to many, many locations, especially with high throughput sequencing technology that chop these reads into small pieces. How can we find all mappings efficiently? That's the first thing. A lot of people try to develop algorithms for this. Still not enough. You need to tolerate small variances and errors in each read because there are machine errors, first of all, and there are also error, uh, subjects' DNA uh, might slightly differ from the reference. There are mismatches, insertions, and deletions, and this actually amplifies the computational problem. The key question is how can we efficiently map each read with up to some number of errors present? And this is actually really interesting. What is the number you assign to E? A lot of the mappers that uh, are used in uh, medicine today have a low value of E. But I believe that actually if you increase the value of E, if you allow much more errors when you're doing this mapping, you can discover a lot more. You can figure out what, how, how, much, how, how much difference you have between this genome and this other genome. And that can enable a lot of discovery. But today's mappers are not very good at uh, uh, doing this if E goes up. Okay, and you need to meet, map each read very fast. Performance is cle clearly important, especially if you want to do this in a minute, right? And this is just part of the problem, right? The bigger problem is you want to answer a high-level question. Right? So, as I said, human DNA is long. You have millions to billions of reads, and state-of-the-art mappers take, depending on the uh, system you use, take weeks uh, to map a human's DNA. This is actually an old slide. Right now, it's less than, less than weeks, but it really depends on the query. Uh, it depends on this E over here, basically. How can you design a much higher performance read mapper? So when we first started, I'm, going, I'm not going to go through the details of these over here. This is really a motivating detour. Uh, we're going to talk about memory systems soon. But when we first started, we said, oh, you first need to look at the mappers. You need to f fix the problem with the mappers. And when we looked at the mappers at the time, they were not comprehensive enough. Are you, are you guys hearing this ringing also? Yeah. It's not good, right? So what should I do? Get to a certain amount, maybe. Say it again. Uh, you should get 
get in like close of your mouth to lower the Oh, okay. Like this? Yeah. Is it better? Like, I don't know how to lower the volume here. Low. Okay, I guess it's low, it's low. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry about that. You can shout, by the, by the way, if it's really bad. <laughs> no problem with that. Uh, okay, basically, this, uh, this mapper that we designed, if you're interested, you can download it, you can play with it. Um, I'm going to give you more references that actually made it faster. This is guaranteed to find all mappings of a read. It's very sensitive and can tolerate many errors, but it's very slow, basically. The problem is, it's slow. It's spending its time in this read alignment. So what is read alignment? This is basically really the fundamentals of matching, approximate string matching. It's edit distance computation. It's defined as the minimum number of edits, insertions, deletions, or substitutions that are needed to make the read exactly match the reference segment. So you have a read that looks like this. Let's say operation is your read. Let's say your reference is organization. How do you match these things to? How many uh, matches are there? How many deletions happen? How many insertions happen? And how many mismatches are there? So in this case, you can see that the edit distance bef between organization and operation is seven, right? Yeah, if I count correctly, it's seven. You have five deletions and two insertions compared to the reference. And as you can see, seven is your error over here. So if you want to detect seven, you need to be able to do this at distance computation. And it turns out this is a very complicated process. People develop dynamic programming algorithms for it, and people try to accelerate it with different algorithms, yet it's still not enough. So our idea was, don't do these computations. So the first idea was algorithmic. You should, before going into hardware, you should really always accelerate the software first. And when we looked at the software, we said, oh, most of these edit distance computations that a mapper is doing is not necessary because if you actually have a filter that looks at some characteristics of the human genome, for example, you can quickly tell if this read is going to match this part of the genome or not. That's the idea. Build a quick filter that tells you, should you do the edit distance computation between this read and this reference part? And if you do that, it turns out you can get rid of many, many of these edit distance computations, approximate string comparisons. I'm not going to tell you exactly how. You can actually tell, uh, read this paper. It's also uh, open source. You can download it and you can use it. It turns out this gets rid of uh, 99, more than 99% of the edit distance computations. So it speeds up the mapper greatly. So we optimize the software now. Now once you optimize the software, the bottleneck shifts somewhere. Now we're shifting a lot more to the memory. And then we actually d d designed new algorithms to take advantage of the uh, SIMD uh, nature of uh, processing units uh, like AVX or SSE. I'm not going to talk about how to do that, but you can actually design this filter to be very accurate and take advantage of SIMD. And then we actually ported uh, the algorithm to the FPGA. So this is the first FPGA based filter. So you can actually, uh, this is the fastest uh, filtering algorithm that we have at the moment, uh, at least in real hardware today. If you're interested, you can download all of these papers. You can actually download the source code, put it on your FPGA, and run it and see how it is. We'd be happy to help also. Uh, so, okay, why am I telling you all of this? Uh, it's a very interesting problem. It's very important. I think it's a forward-looking application. The problem is DNA read mapping and filtering, especially after you really optimize the software and be intelligent about how you do the software, it's heav heavily bottlenecked by data movement. So the gatekeeper, the FPGA that I briefly described, its performance is limited by the DRM bandwidth. We can Basically, we cannot, put, we cannot get more performance uh, unless you increase the DRM bandwidth. That's true for this uh, shifted Hamming distance uh, that, uh, algorithm that we have on SIMD, uh, and these are published at Bioinformatics, as you can see. So the solution that we've been pursuing more recently is using processing in memory. This can alleviate the bottleneck. We're going to talk a lot about processing in memory in a later lecture, but I'm going to uh, give you a glimpse of it right now. These, uh, the problem is we need to design mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. And that's exactly what we did. By the, way, by the way, that's also true for any kind of accelerator design. You need to design your algorithm together with the hardware. But that's true for processing in memory as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about this paper later on when we talk about processing in memory. But that's essentially what we've, did, we've done. We designed the filtering algorithm completely from scratch such that it fits the requirements of the memory system uh, or, or processing in memory. And you can actually do very simple operations in memory to do the filtering much faster. And this is really the state of the art. Uh, I'm going to give you some of the key principles and results that we followed. Basically, we followed two key principles overall. One is we exploit the structure of the genome to minimize computation. This is software algorithmic principle. And the second is you morph and exploit the structure of the underlying hardware uh, to maximize performance and efficiency. This is essentially acceleration. But how do you do it is a key question. You do it in memory, you do it in the FPGA, you do it in uh, SIMD. Ideally, you would like to combine all of those. 
So it's really algorithm arch architecture co-designed for DNA read mapping, the problem that I've discussed. It turns out it speeds up read mapping by about 200x, sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on your data set, clearly, if you're looking at a human or a bacteria. And also it depends on the distribution of, uh, it depends on your E as, as well, right? I'm not going to talk about it. If you're interested, you can read the papers. And it improves accuracy of read mapping also in the presence of errors, but I'm not going to talk about that aspect. So 200x, the key question is, is it enough? Clearly this is not enough. Uh, and 200x uh, is with the real data sets. So you could actually exaggerate this to be much higher, but we, t uh, we decide not to do that. Uh, with real data sets, you get 200x combined uh, with all of these optimizations. Clearly that's not enough. Yeah, if you start with weeks and you reduce it by 200x, you don't get to a minute. So we need to do more. But I think there are a lot of other interesting opportunities over here. This is a paper that we recently wrote in Briefings in Bioinformatics that actually looks at this device. This is Oxford Nanopore Technologies Minion device. Uh, the beauty of this device is, first of all, it's small. Uh, so you can actually sequence any genome with it. Uh, and the second beauty is it gives you longer reads. The reads are on the order of 10,000, 100,000 length. The downside is the error rate is very high, which means that you need to do actually many, many of these read mappings to build confidence. So the computational problem didn't go away. There's no device that gives you very long reads at, uh, at low error rates. That's a technology problem, and people should be working on that, but that's a fundamentally different problem, difficult problem. But the beauty of this device is now people actually can sequence any genome. You can actually buy this device for $1,000, maybe 2000 and you can sequence any genome you, you want once you figure out how to do that. Uh, people are do, uh, sequencing uh, different virus genomes in Africa, for example, but they're doing something that's not really smart after that because of the, the way we design systems. What they do is they take the data, their laptops are not good enough to do the analysis. They send it through the wireless network to a data center, let's say in US or Europe, and then that data center does the analysis. Now, basically, you built this device very efficient, and you move all of that data to somewhere else and waste a lot of time. So it's good to question this sort of system design. We're doing this at all levels of the system design today. The question is, how do we actually get some computation in here such that we do it right inside the device? maybe without even moving the data anywhere else from the device. Uh, so if you're really interested in this technology, I, I think this technology is very interesting. There's a lot more to do. Basically, you, uh, what this technology generates is it's really a nanoscale hole. It passes the DNA through this nanopore, and uh, uh, it, it basically senses the current as the DNA passes, and different bases give different current values. And essentially, those are signals. You get these raw signal data with the current. You need to do the signal processing to map those signals to ACTGs, right? And this turns out to be one of the big computational bottlenecks also, so there's a lot to do over here as well. Today, that's not, that even that's not done in the device, it's done in the data center somewhere far away from the device, which makes no sense, I think. And then you need to do overlap finding. If you're interested in this, you can take a look at this paper, and then you need to do some assembly. Read mapping that we've discussed so far is just this part of the step. So there's a lot more in the genome sequence analysis stack that is very much uh, causing latency and performance issues and energy efficiency issues. And it turns out a lot of these are memory bound. Okay, no, I can, I can go and talk a lot more about this, but I think I'm going to stop related to bioinformatics right now. I have uh, longer lectures uh, that I've given at different places. Uh, maybe in some other occasion you'll see me talking about this. So recall our dream. Our dream was can we build devices that can analyze a genome within a minute? Uh, are we there yet? Still a long ways to go. That's nice for people like you who can actually uh, come up with new ideas, right? Because we are in need of new ideas. First of all, energy efficiency is a key problem. Performance is uh, a key problem. Security is another problem. We're going to talk about that. But basically, we have a huge memory bottleneck in this sort of application. And I just picked on one application. You can pick on many, many other applications, which we're going to talk about later on. I like this application because I think it's very forward looking. It can enable much more things. Okay, so we're done with this one. So we're going to talk about these other things as well. Uh, now let me jump into those other things. I'm going to talk about all of those other things within the context of memory because memory is the big bottleneck. And if I'm going too fast, please let me know. Is this too fast? No? Okay. Oh, you guys are fast. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about the main memory system over here. Uh, main memory system sits in between processing units uh, and storage. It's a critical component of all computing systems that we design today. Uh, server, mobile, embedded desktop sensor, whatever you design, it needs to have some working storage. 
and it must scale in many, many dimensions in terms of size, capacity, in terms of technology, in terms of efficiency, in terms of cost, and in terms of the algorithms we use to manage it. Uh, if you want to maintain the performance growth and the scaling benefits that we've been used to so far. If you want to build this device that we dreamed of, you actually need to improve all of these over here in the memory system. Because that device is memory bottlenecked, I can guarantee you. And it doesn't matter what you attach to this memory system, processors or FPGAs or GPUs, they're bottlenecked by this uh, part. This is another view of the memory system. This is not looking good. I think it's, uh, it's the VGA cable that's not transmitting some things but I don't think I can solve this problem at low latency at least. So this is my cartoonish picture, uh, it's an, uh, drawn in XFIC. Basically what this shows is uh, uh, cores, these are red, uh, and uh, cores are the only places where you do the computation today. Everything else, caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, memory controllers, other interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, and other storage or caches, uh, basically, we're building the system and most of it is dedicated to data movement and storage. Computation is a very little part. And even if you look at the cores, most of it is really part of the memory system. Register file, L1 cache, interconnect, all of that are, that is there for data movement and storage. So computation is not a problem basically. We know how to put cores into a system, but we don't know how to really deal with data. That is, that, as a result, we are designing these systems that look like this. And we're going to ask the question, is this a good way of designing the system, especially later uh, during this, uh, le this uh, lecture series. So this is in one slide. Uh, there's also another point over here. Uh, all of this memory system that's moving and storing data is also a shared resource. It's shared across the co uh, applications or threads that are running on the course. And this causes a resource management problem, a quality of service problem, a predictable uh, latency problem. We're not going to focus as much about that. Uh, it was actually a focus of the uh, uh, cases lectures that I gave five years ago. If you're interested in that, there's a lot of literature. I'm going to point you to some, but that's a very, very important problem also. So let me tell you about the state of the main memory system in one slide very quickly, and then we're going to expand. There's some recent technology, architecture, and application trends that lead to some new requirements from the system and that exacerbate some old requirements. And we've always demanded a lot from the system. We're demanding a lot more. Uh, and I will show you that DRAM and memory controllers, as we know them and as we design them today, are unlikely to satisfy these requirements. And there are some memory technologies that enable new opportunities, like emerging memory technologies, like phase change memory. We're going to not going to talk about, uh, about that a lot, but you can think of processing in memory as an example of this also. Uh, so we need to give, uh, rethink the me main memory system given these trends to fix the issues we're having with DRAM, and we're going to talk about a lot of the issues and enable some of these emerging memory technologies while satisfying all of the requirements that we have over here. And that's the key challenge. The problem is technology is not easy and requirements are not easy. We're going to be a lot more stringent than the requirements that we pose. So let's talk about the trends. Uh, so these are three major trends that are affecting main memory as I see them today. The first is hopefully obvious based on what I've described so far. You need more memory capacity more bandwidth, more quality of service, more performance. It doesn't fit over here, but you can imagine performance. And this is really driven by three major things that is going to stay with us for a long time. Basically, we can put many, many computational units on a single node, on a single data center. Computation is not the bottleneck that we have. Moore's law, I don't believe is ending. Moore's law is going strong. We could actually still put transistors onto the chip. Uh, it will end at some point, no question about that. But we are able to do that. Uh, as a result, we get all these accelerators. Maybe we're not able to power them up. That's true. Uh, power is a bigger problem than Moore's law ending, in my opinion. But we are able to do that. That's why we, we have all this heterogeneity in the system when we have the multi-core. Applications are becoming increasingly data intensive. There's a lot. Uh, I gave you one example. There's a lot more. Uh, and we, are, we want to consolidate more and more. We want to put many, many applications together on the same chip, same node, same data center, same system such that we get much more higher efficiency in terms of performance, in terms of area, in terms of energy, in terms of cost, in terms of cooling. If you consolidate, you get a lot more efficiency. But if you do all of this, which we're doing, and we're going to do a lot more of, your capacity, bandwidth, performance, quality of service, predictability requirements go up significantly. Let's take a look at one example of this. This is actually a paper from HP Labs and University of Michigan from 2009. They examined how fast the core count is increasing and how fast the DRAM capacity is increasing. And they found that core count is increasing much faster than DRAM capacity. And you can argue with these numbers. Is the trend the same? Is the trend not the same? Uh, maybe the trend is not the same. If you look at GPUs, core counts are still increasing a lot. 
but uh, maybe not in the general purpose domain, but you should always ask the question, why isn't it increasing a lot? Maybe we're memory bottlenecked actually. GPUs are able to increase the core counts because they actually increase the memory bandwidth also with new technologies like high bandwidth memory. And if, you, if, your memory, if your memory bottlenecked, maybe this curve will not increase because you're not able to sustain uh, data uh, delivery to the cores. So you can, these trends are also de dependent on each other in my opinion. Uh, okay, uh, basically they show that memory capacity per core is expected to drop by 30% every two years. This is really not a good, I good trend because software for a long time has relied on increasing uh, memory space, memory capacity, such that you get more features uh, and much better software in the end. Okay, this is actually a good side of the story. There's a bad side, which is bandwidth. <laughs> if you look at memory bandwidth per core, it's, much it it's increasing much slowly. Uh, it's actually increasing by about 10% every year, which is much less than what you see over here for capacity. Uh, now, we'll we're going to talk about 3D stack technologies, which is going to increase it a little bit, but then after that, uh, it's not clear if it's going to increase it uh, as much like that. Okay, let's, let's have some fun with these trends a little bit. Uh, I'm going to plot over here uh, what's happened to DRAM devices in the last 18 years and the improvement that you get. And we're going to plot capacity, bandwidth, and latency. And this is for uh, the dominant DRAM device of the day, which is the DDR uh, technology. How much do you think capacity has improved in a DRAM device, DRAM chip, in the last 18 years? 100. Okay, that's a good guess. It's about 128x. Uh, and this is the good side. So we, we're able to cram more chips, uh, more, more, more things into uh, a given area. As a result, capacity has been improving, but we're, we've been having difficulties recently. So this is a result of the Moore's law, and maybe you can argue that Moore's law is slowing. Uh, that could be true because of the reliability issues that we have, we, we're going to talk about. What about bandwidth? 10. 10x, okay, you guys are good. <laughs> it's about 20x. <laughs> so bandwidth has improved by 20x, uh, and bandwidth is actually uh, harder to improve because Moore's law doesn't directly give you bandwidth. So you need to do something more intelligent to get bandwidth. But bandwidth is really a function of the money you pay. You can actually parallelize things. You can add more channels. So bandwidth is not as hard as what we're going to talk about next. And actually, 3D stacking technologies improve it a little bit more like this. It's like a step function, which is not plotted here. What about latency? Mostly the same, yes. Basically, it's improved by 30% over the last 18 years. There are two reasons for this. One, it's hard to improve. Latency is a lot harder than all of the other things over here, because Moore's law actually doesn't help you with latency, especially with interconnects that much. Uh, it can scale the size of your logic, but your, your interconnect remains there, and you're most, mostly interconnect dominated in latency. And the second thing is about the mindset. So a lot of this is about the mindset, because when you're designing a memory chip, you usually start with the capacity. Capacity is the easiest to improve, and once you focus on capacity a lot, maybe too much, you ignore some of the other things that are important into the system. So we're going to challenge that mindset later on in this uh, set of lectures. Okay, but uh, clearly there are applications that drive all of these requirements. For example, some of them are both capacity limited, but they're also latency limited. And I, I think of these as more backward looking applications, right? These already exist, people know that they're important and they're going to be important even into the future. Graph processing, for example, is extremely important for bioinformatics, uh, for machine learning also. A lot of the machine learning frameworks are graph based. Uh, but latency is important for all of them. So these are some of the driving applications in the past. The key question is what are the driving applications into the future also? But I can guarantee you that uh, those driving applications will be memory bound and latency will be important for them, especially if you want to analyze data at real time very quickly at, uh, at high energy efficiency. Okay, this is the next trend that I'm going to talk about briefly. Basically energy and power is a key system design concern. Uh, and this has been like that for a long time. Uh, this paper, uh, Charles Lefergy and others from IEEE Computer, that analyzed IBM's big iron servers, and they showed that uh, at that time, around 2000 or so, 40 to 50 percent of the entire system energy in IBM's big iron servers is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. And at that time, off-chip memory hierarchy consisted of DRAM, off-chip caches, off-chip storage, off-chip interconnect, a lot of stuff other than DRAM. Now, fast forward to Power 8. This is another IBM paper analyze the system power consumption in power eight system, systems, and they say more than 40% of the power is just in DRAM. So clearly the memory power is growing. That's true for GPUs also. These are results from Georgia Tech, I think. They've analyzed the GPU power consumption, and they said that more than 40% of the GPU power is spent in DRAM. This is very similar to our results. We actually do a lot of these studies, which I'm going to talk about. We also see more than 40% of the system power is in DRAM. 
especially when, if, you're, if you're idle, actually, even more of the system power is in the air. Uh, so clearly, uh, memory power is growing. And if you want to have big memory systems, it's growing a lot faster. And one of the issues uh, DRAM, is DRAM consumes power even when it's not used. You need to periodically refresh it. This thing over here is right now refreshing memory and wasting my battery. It's a bit annoying, right? It shouldn't be doing that. But anyway, it's doing that because of the technology. Technology is not flawless. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about refresh, but I talked a lot about refresh uh, five years ago. Uh, but this is a critical problem, actually. Refresh. The fact that you need to refresh DRAM is really the fundamental scaling problem of DRAM, and we're going to talk about that. If you can get rid of refresh somehow in DRAM, you can scale DRAM to much higher technology. Now, there are other reliability issues, but they may be a little bit easier to solve than determining the retention times of DRAM. So that ties into the next point. Uh, basically, DRAM technology scaling is ending. People, ITRS, which used to exist, International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors, it used to uh, project that DRAM doesn't scale well below X nanometers. And clearly, X is a number that they assign uh, to every year, but they change it every year. And I don't want to change my slides. <laughs> Keeping slides coherent with the latest technology is very hard, actually, because technology is changing really fast. But clearly, as you reduce the feature size of the DRAM cell, this is the feature size of a DRAM cell. As you reduce that, you get higher capacity, higher density, lower cost, and lower energy. Essentially, this is Moore's law, basically. Now, this is Moore's law. I'm not saying Moore's law is necessarily ending, but it's becoming much, much more difficult uh, because of reliability issues. So uh, we'll talk about this X over here. So if this goes away, uh, basically, if, if we're not able to scale uh, the size of the DRAM cell uh, much smaller, then we're going to have a lot more difficulty satisfying all of these requirements because energy will increase and we, we're not going to be able to increase capacity. We may be able to increase bandwidth, right? Because bandwidth is something else. You can actually, but then you, that comes at a cost. Okay, uh, basically, what, I'll talk briefly about the DRAM scaling problem because we're going to uh, focus a lot on that. Uh, like any other memory technology, any memory technology needs two things. One is uh, the access device, uh, I'm sorry, the storage device to store data, and the other is the access device to access the data. And for any memory to work, both of these need to work well, reliably. So in DRAM, the storage device is charge-based, it's the capacitor, uh, and this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing, and the access device is this access transistor, the bit line, and the sense amplifier that basically connects to the capacitor and senses what's in the capacitor. Right. Now, for this to work, this access device needs to work well. This access transistor should be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. Bit line needs to work. Your sense amplifier needs to have good noise margin. It needs to work. Right. As you reduce the size of the cell, both of these properties become difficult to maintain. Reliable operation becomes very difficult, uh, especially at very, very low technology nodes. So this was the value that was assigned to X by ITRS in 2009. They said, below X equals 35, we're going to have a lot of challenges. And that's true. That's been true, which means that capacity, cost, and energy power will be hard to scale. What do you think the size of the DRAM cell today uh, is in the cutting edge technology? 14, 8, 10, yeah. 22, OK. It's actually somewhere in between. It's about 17 nanometers. Today. Clearly, we're much below 35 nanometers. So clearly, Moore's law didn't end. It's not going to end for a while because people are going to push the technology because there's benefit from pushing the technology. But this has come at a cost. Uh, so they were right, actually. It was challenging. And I'm going to give you examples of why they were right. Uh, this is actually a fun question that I ask when I talk to uh, the memory vendors. When I go to Samsung, Hynix, uh, and Micron, for example, I ask the question to the DRM designers. Uh, what do you think is the limit of DRAM technology? How much can you f push further? And the lowest answer I got was 7 nanometers so far. <laughs> we're not there at 7 nanometers, we're at 17 nanometers, and 17 nanometers came at a cost. We'll see how, how, how far we can go to the 7 nanometers. And then maybe we need to switch to some other technology uh, in a different way, but we can talk about that. So basically, there are limits to charge memory. It's difficult to place and control charge. In DRAM, it's the capacity, capacitor charge. It leaks. And there are a lot of other reliability issues. In Flash, we're going to talk hopefully briefly about also. We'll have time. Last time I didn't talk about this, but Flash is very, very interesting as well. And it's good to understand these technologies. It's the floating gate charge. Charge gets trapped in this floating gate, and that's how you store data. The problem is both of these are charge-based, and charge-based technologies have issues with reliable sensing as charge storage unit size reduces. As a result, uh, I'm going to, you, can, you can look at the papers. People have developed other emerging memory technologies that are a little bit different. Uh, some of them are still charge-based, of course. 3D stacked DRAM is very interesting, I think. You get higher bandwidth. Reduced latency DRAM, we'll talk about a lot. You get lower latency. 
low power DRAM, which is going to be everywhere, I think. Everything is going to be low power, in my opinion. So we, we're, we're not going to, we're going to get rid of the LP, in my opinion. Everything will be low power. It's important. And non-volatile memory technologies are also very promising because they give you larger capacity and potential low power as well. The downside is they all have downsides. So there is no single memory technology that's green at every metric that we want. And actually, this is really interesting because people, for example, when they were developing STTM RAM, they were very excited. They said, this is the universal memory technology that's, good at, that's green at every single metric. Clearly, very quickly, people realize that that's not true. It's a good thing to strive for in research, but it's very difficult, in my opinion, to achieve. And I think if you achieve a memory technology that's good at all of these metrics, maybe you'll win the Turing Award or something even bigger. Okay. So as a result of this trend, you get this, basically. And this is uh, another trend, basically. We want, we, we're having more heterogeneous or hybrid main memory systems. If there is no technology that's good at everything, why don't we put, at, put different technologies into the system that are good at different things and bad at different things and design the hardware and the software to manage the data allocation and movement between them to achieve the greens as much as possible of each technology while avoiding the reds as much as possible of each technology. And this is a trend that's already happening. For example, GPUs already have uh, 3D stacked or 2.5D stacked high bandwidth memory over here. And they also have some other uh, low bandwidth, high latency, high capacity memory on this other side. right? And there's a trade-off, clearly. And this is going to happen a lot more with emerging memory technologies. It's going to happen a lot more phase change memory. When we first started looking at this, this was the picture, basically DRAM and phase change memory. But there's a lot of research to be done in this area also. I'm not going to talk about this. Unfortunately, there's not enough time, but this is exciting. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk separately. So one foreshadowing that I'll give you is if you design a system like this, your memory controller better be intelligent because it needs to orchestrate this data movement over here. It needs to minimize the latencies. It needs to figure out what to prioritize and what not to prioritize. Maybe it even needs to keep track of the contents of some of these memories. And if you don't do that, if you punt to system software, these memories are really fast. You become very slow. So your memory controller has to be intelligent. And this, take this as a foreshadowing. We're going to build up uh, a lot more ex evid uh, evidence uh, for this. OK, industry is writing papers about it too. DRAM scaling is real. Uh, I'm going to give you real data later on. But before we get to the real data, this is a paper that was written by Samsung and Intel. These two companies don't normally talk to each other. And they wrote this paper. Uh, uh, on our memory form in 2014 because they said DRAM process scaling is becoming very difficult. Refresh is a huge problem. We don't know how to uh, refresh uh, is, is increasing as you reduce the size of the circuit. Uh, write latencies are increasing and there's this phenomenon called variable retention time that makes, us, ma makes it very difficult for us to determine the retention time of a DRAM cell. How long can a cell retain data? And this is actually really interesting. I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, right now. Basically, this is a quantum-like effect. As you reduce the size of the circuit, you run into these quantum-like effects, in my opinion, that are kind of random. This actually uh, was well known. It was discovered by Yaney in 1987. Uh, but it, it became a huge problem in DRAM much more recently. And the problem is, if you test the DRAM cell right now, it can retain data for, let's say, 100 seconds. And most DRAM cells are actually very strong. Uh, but if you test it, Let's say a minute later, it cannot retain data for longer than 8 milliseconds. So it has this random varying retention time. That's called variable retention time. And this happens because of, in my opinion, quantum-like circuit effects. Charge gets trapped in the access transistor. Uh, it's called trap-induced gate, uh, mm, trap-assisted gate-induced drain leakage. And once charge gets trapped over there, the capacitor's charge drains really, really fast. And this happens randomly. And this happens a lot more as you scale the size of the circuit down to very small nodes. Now, if you have this phenomenon, how do you determine the retention time of a DRAM cell? How often should you refresh DRAM? You can say, oh, I'm going to ignore this. I'm going to use the worst case to refresh. That becomes terrible for your performance and power. OK, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. But this gives you one example of the circuit scaling challenge that are faced uh, as you reduce the size of the circuit. So what they've argued, these folks, which we're going to talk about also, is co-architecting DRAM and controllers to enhance DRAM process scaling. What does this mean? DRAM may not be very reliable. It may have all of these issues. But you can design a controller that's intelligent, that basically figures out what's happening in, in terms of reliability in DRAM, and it fixes the problem. Error correcting codes could be one of them. Actually, this paper is one of the first in the DRAM literature to propose error correcting codes realistically in future DRAM technologies. Today, or maybe next year, if you buy a phone, it's going to have LPDDR memory with error correcting codes inside the memory. 
And if you actually think about it, if you went to a DRAM manufacturer five years ago, 10 years ago, if you told them, oh, I want to reserve part of your main memory capacity for error correcting code so that you are more reliable, they would kick you out of the room. Hmm. Because that directly affects their cost per bit, right? But today they're putting it inside the DRAM. Basically, that, that area is not usable for real data storage anymore, but it's correcting the errors that are happening because of refresh, because of VRT, dot, dot, dot. So clearly this is a problem, and actually this is their call for intelligent memory controllers, as you can see. And this is a beautiful paper. If you're interested, I'd recommend reading it. It's only a four-page paper, and the slides are also available online. Okay, uh, now that I've motivated you, hopefully, let's talk about what we will talk about in this course. And I'm far behind, as you can see, in terms of the slides, but that's okay. Some of these slides are background material, so I may, we may not be able to cover all of the slides that I said. So let me talk about what we will discuss in this course. This is the course logistics. Uh, we're here for five days. Uh, we've, talk, we've been talking about memory trends and basics. I'm going to cover as many basics as possible today. And then we're going to jump into the second topic, reliability and security. We're going to talk about Rollhammer and beyond, some of the interesting reliability and security issues. And then we're going to jump into in-memory computation. And then we'll talk about low latency memory and latency reliability energy trade-offs. These really complex trade-offs that are going to become even more interesting into the future. And these topics Scratch that unlikely, it's not going to happen, basically, clearly. <laughs> but uh, enabling and exploiting non-volatile memory, I have a lot of slides for them, and flash memory and SSD scaling. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that, depending on. Uh, I, may, I may actually sneak some of that into reliability and security, but there's a lot more to do over here, of course. And there are a bunch of readings that are posted. If you're interested, you can actually go to my website and click on the Cases Summer School link, and you can get all of these slides uh, and some more readings online. Okay, basically this course uh, will cover many problems and potential solutions related to the design of memory systems in the many core era, or actually many core may be the outdated thing over here, I should have fixed that. Uh, the design of the memory system poses many interesting challenges. Difficult research as well as engineering problem, we're going to talk about both. Uh, but the engineering problem that Samsung and Intel is facing is really a research problem also. How do you actually get rid of refresh, for example? That's a clearly a research problem, it's not an engineering problem. It's an engineering problem that is affecting them at this moment, but you have to solve it with research approaches. Uh, and important fundamental problems, I'm going to give you hopefully what is fundamental, and industry relevant problems, clearly people are actually having pains with a lot of these problems. And I think if you solve these problems, they can, it can actually revolutionize the world. If you could actually cha change the computing paradigm. That's what I believe in. Uh, and hopefully, if you're doing a PhD, you believe in this also. Okay, uh, I think many creative and insightful solutions, as I said earlier, are needed to solve these problems. And the goal is, I think, in this course, the goal, the goal I have is to give you the basics to develop such solutions by covering fundamentals and cutting edge research as much as possible within the course of six hours or so. Okay, this is my contact information. As I said, feel free to talk to me. Actually, I would re uh, recommend that you uh, find me and talk, talk to me. I'd be happy to talk with every one of you. Uh, you can actually text me. I use WhatsApp. WhatsApp is the easiest way to reach me these days. Email is just too much, but feel free to email me also. And all of this course slides, papers, and updates are actually on this website. You can go through the uh, go to this uh, through my own website. And for the curious, you, uh, yeah, I actually have uh, the uh, the slides as well as videos uh, from uh, five years ago as well. We're not going to cover every. Uh, actually, the overlap between the courses are really in the basics and maybe some of the really, really uh, interesting areas, but there's not much overlap between the courses. Okay, how to make the best out of this course? I can see that a lot of people are doing this already. <laughs> Being alert, clearly the course is fast-paced. Uh, there's a lot to cover in memory systems. There, it's, it's impossible not to be uh, fast-paced, I think. The, uh, the alternative is being really slow-paced and actually missing out on a lot of other things. So which, which alternative do you want is? <laughs> Uh, it's interesting, yeah. Do the reading. I would recommend doing the readings. I'll provide many, 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 many references. Clearly, you're not going to be able to do that in the five days, but you can do that later on, and you can explore on your own even more. And if you, if you need it, I would recommend going back and reinforcing fundamentals. And there are a lot of pointers that I have to basic computer architecture materials. These are all, all on the website already. And I think I, I really like this quote, quote by Louis Pasteur. He says, chance favors a pre prepared mind. I think that's why all of you are here, basically. So, so you're increasing your chances by being prepared. Pure luck exists, but it's, it's really a small probability. <laughs> okay, so unfortunately there's no time for, this is what we're not going to cover. Uh, memory interference and quality of service, it's critical. Predictable performance, quality of service of our memory designs, critically important. Emerging memory technology is critically important. Hybrid memories, cache management, interconnects. There are many pointers uh, on my website, and I, I give lectures on all of these topics. 
sometimes very long lectures, but you can take a look at them if you're interested. This, these doesn't, this doesn't mean that they're not important. Actually, I think this is extremely important, actually, predictable performance, for example, enabling emerging memory technologies. You have to have these predictable performance, especially if you want to build a device, we call the dream, that embedded device that can do this analysis within a minute. You have to have predictable performance. How do you provide that in the, uh, in the presence of different interference effects that are happening? Okay, uh, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but there are some reference overview papers. We write some of these overview papers sometimes. This is the, one of the latest ones. Uh, this is related to processing in memory. It's an overview paper that talks about challenges, mechanisms, and future research directions. You can take a look at it. Uh, we, we put the papers on archive, so even though they're book chapters, they're really available freely to everyone. Uh, there's another paper. Uh, this is a little bit old right now, but it covers a lot of the basics as well. Uh, and this is a relatively recent one, talks about the Rove Hammer problem. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and this, uh, this is actually one of the, fir first, the first ones I've written uh, on uh, memory scaling. And this fifth one is uh, about flash memory drives. This is relatively recent also, but it summarizes our eight years of research in flash memory scaling and error characterization. I find this really, really interesting because I think DRAM and other memory technologies are going to become more like flash memory, except we need to do it even better. We need to be at much lower latency. Okay, I'm going to just flash these. There are a bunch of related videos and course materials. If you actually in, you want guidance, I'd be happy to guide you to which ones to look at. Uh, they're slightly different from each other in different ways. And we have a lot of open source tools. You can take a look at them. I'm going to talk about some of these, like Ramulator, Rowhammer, and uh, SoftMC. But if you're interested, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of these clearly. You can go to our website and download all of these tools. These tools can enable your research. And usually, uh, we, we'd be happy to support them in my research group with my students and postdocs. And all of the reference papers are online. Clearly, you can look here, but you can also look over here to my projects. OK, uh, sorry, I'm going through this relatively quickly. Uh, but you have the slides as well as the slides are available online PowerPoints. Let's go into fundamentals a little bit in the remaining uh, 20 minutes uh, over here. Any burning questions? I can take a burning question right now. If you, if you cannot wait. No? Nobody's burning yet. OK. <laughs> OK, we're going to talk about memory clearly. And memory in a modern system looks like this. This is AMD Barcelona, circa 2005. Uh, clearly, you have memory everywhere, as we've discussed. Uh, Ideal memory, ide it's always good to think about ideal. Uh, I like, uh, when you're doing research, always think about the ideal and try to achieve that ideal. Ideal memory means you have zero latency, infinite capacity, zero cost, and infinite bandwidth. Wouldn't be nice to have it, right? Uh, the problem is, <laughs> these ideal memory requirements oppose each other in a very fundamental way. Bigger is slower, uh, faster is more expensive. <laughs> and, that's, and higher bandwidth is more expensive. And I don't even talk about low latency here because we're going to talk about that later on. So bigger takes longer to determine the location. Faster requires a faster technology, faster interconnect. Uh, and technology becomes more expensive. Faster interconnect becomes more expensive. Higher bandwidth is more expensive because you need more banks, more ports, higher frequency, or some faster technology. All of that comes at cost, basically. Uh, and clearly, because of this, ideal memory requir uh, requirements uh, oppose each other. And we've talked about DRAM. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. How many people have taken a computer architecture course before? OK. Not everyone, I guess. And that's what I expected, because that was the case last time. That's why I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But we may not be able to cover everything, so I'd recommend that you study the material that we don't cover. So dynamic random access memory is DRAM. This was invented in 1965, before 1965, by Bob Denard, which was talked about. And uh, he has a patent at IBM. Bob Denard is famous for Denard scaling, but he's actually also the inventor of DRAM. Uh, maybe the not scaling ended, but the DRAM didn't end. Uh, anyway, but basically, the DRAM stores uh, charge in the, inside this capacitor. Basically, the capacitor charge or discharge state indicates storage of one or zero, and you can encode them in different ways. Uh, and you have one capacitor, essentially, and one access transistor to be able to access it through the bit line over here. Capacitor leaks through the RC path, and you lose charge uh, over time because of that leakage. That's why you need to have refresh. And if you're interested in refresh, this is a paper that I covered in five years ago. I'm going to talk about briefly. But this would, uh, I would recommend this as a reference paper that we've written on refresh. It opened up a lot of other issues in refresh that we've examined later on. I'm going to talk about this briefly uh, in tomorrow's lecture, hopefully. Uh, or maybe today. We'll see. OK, this is another technology, SRAM. It's very different. It consists of these two cross-coupled inverters that trap charge essentially between them. And this feedback path enables the stored value to stay in the cell. But it requires four transistors. It's a lot. 
and two more access transistors. So it's at least six transistors over here. That's why this is huge compared to DRAM. As a result, you don't use SRAM everywhere in the system. And that's a fundamental limitation. This is another technology, phase change memory. It's an aside, we're not gonna talk about that a lot, but this is very exciting also. Intel, I, I think, still hasn't publicly admitted that 3D point is uh, phase change memory, but there's good evidence that it's phase change memory. Uh, and this is based on phase change material. It exists in two states. Uh, basically, low, uh, amorphous state has high electrical resistivity, crystalline state has low electrical resistivity, and you can switch reliably between these two states. So this technology is really old technology. It's non-volatile because once you actually switch to a state, it stays there for tens of years. Uh, it's old technology. It's used in rewritable CDs, and rewritable CDs exploit the fact that uh, these two different states have different reflexivities. So if you shine light on them, you get different uh, behavior. Now, it has become really interesting to examine this within the context of memory, not because of the storage device, but because of this access device. So there was no uh, fast way of reliably reading uh, this phase change uh, material in the past. But IBM, for example, did a lot of development over time, and they figured out how to build this access device really reliably and fast. As a result, phase change memory became really interesting to examine as in the context of main memory recently. So this technology change actually can enable uh, huge differences in main memory also, but I'm not going to talk about that, as I said. But it's always good to understand why the technology has improved. The technology has improved not because of the storage device, but really because of the access device. As I said, memory always has storage device and access device, and you need to have both of them working well for your memory to work well. And if you're interested, again, this is, uh, this is a paper that I covered last time, uh, five years ago. Uh, and there are a lot of other issues over here which we're not going to talk about. All of these memories have upsides and downsides. But this is a contender for becoming part of main memory today. And I think, see, as you can see, we did the research in 2007, 2008 timeframe. The paper was published in 2009. And right now is the time when Intel is actually introducing, uh, 10 years later, right, uh, DIMMs that actually have uh, 3DX point in them. Okay, and that's the reading. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. And this is uh, some other reading uh, that's an extended uh, version of that paper. So we're going to talk about some fundamentals really quickly. Bank is a fundamental concept because a lot of other things I'm going to talk about will build upon this. Bank, this is not a financial bank. <laughs> when, when people talk about banks in Switzerland, it's usually a financial bank, but this is really a structural bank over here. The problem is if you have a single big monolithic array, uh, it takes long to access. There are two issues with it. It takes very long to access if the array is monolithic because you have a very long interconnect to access it in both dimensions, 2D, uh, and if you actually have 3D, that's another thing. Uh, that also becomes longer. And also you cannot enable multiple axes in parallel and cheap. So if you actually chop up this array into smaller pieces called banks, you can reduce the latency as well as enable multiple axes in parallel. So this is a very fundamental concept that improves both your latency and bandwidth if you do it right. And that's the idea basically. You divide the array into multiple banks such that they can be accessed independently in the same cycle or in the consecutive cycles. Each bank is smaller than the entire memory storage and accesses to different banks can be now overlapped. And there are also issues related to it. How do you map data to different banks? How do you interleave data across banks? This becomes important. And banks were initially developed for vector processors such that you can get high bandwidth. Uh, like Cray1, for example, had a system that had 16 banks to tolerate the latency of 11, memory, 11 cycles memory access. And they wanted to have a vector processor that can actually get one memory item, uh, one data item, one word in a given cycle. Uh, okay, so this is a bank basically, uh, pictorially. Uh, you, it's a two dimensional storage array. Each of them are memory cells over here. Uh, this could be, for example, 30, I don't know, 1000 over here, and this could be uh, 2000 over here. It's usually, try to, you try to make it square. And when you get an address, you decode the address, the row address, and that decode activates the word line over here. Uh, you basically read an entire chunk over here, it's called a row. You bring the row into over here, into the sense amplifiers, which are not shown here. And from the sense amplifiers, you basically figure out what data that you really need out of those one kilobyte or eight kilobytes, for example. So the l least significant bits of the address, column address, determines which part of the data that you want to mux out from this mux over here. So clearly there is a long uh, access sequence over here, which again, I'm not going to go into. You can read these slides and these are relatively basics, but you need to decode the ad row address. You need to uh, the selected bits drive the bit lines, which is the entire uh, row is driven. You amplify the row data in the sense amplifiers. You decode the column 
address and select the subset of the row. And once you're done with the access, you need to go uh, put the uh, array back into a state that is accessible. This is called the pre-charging of the bit lines. We're going to talk more about that pre-charging later on. And all of the memories kind of look like this. If you look at DRAM, it looks like this. If you look at SRAM, it looks like this. If you look at PCM, it looks like this. If you look at flash, it looks like this. Relatively similar. So that's why banking is a very fundamental concept. So memory hierarchy, I'll talk about this also. Uh, memory hierarchy is important because it exploits some principles. This doesn't mean that we should be designing systems that look like this going forward. But I think some of the fundamental principles we cannot avoid because they're really fundamental to the characteristics of the applications. Basically, and also our requirements. We want both fast and large. The problem is we cannot achieve both with a single level of memory. That's why we have multiple levels of storage which get progressively bigger and slower as they become farther away from the computation unit. And we, we try to ensure that most of the data in the, pro the processor needs, or the computation unit needs, is kept in the faster levels. And this is an example of the memory hierarchy, basically. You have register files, which are part of the memory hierarchy, compiler managed, uh, caches, potentially compiler managed if they're scratch pads, and then different ca levels of caches, main memory and hard disk. So there are trade-offs, clearly. Okay, so what is fundamental? Temporal locality is very fundamental. Even in processing memory, when we will talk about, we will say that or you need to exploit temporal locality even on the memory side because if you don't, you have to access the memory a lot. So why don't we build a small cache closer to memory? So this is fundamental. Some of the memory hierarchy principles will not go away uh, anytime soon, I think. Uh, basically, the idea is to store recently accessed data and automatically manage fast memory. This is called cache because you anticipate that the data will be accessed again soon. And if you had time, I would give you a lot of analogies, but we don't have time. And this is what Maurice Wilkes had in mind when he wrote the cache paper. Uh, he said, basically, the users discussed of a fast core memory of 32,000 words as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words, such that in such a way that in practical cases, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. It's beautifully explained, right? It's a three-page paper that I would recommend everybody to read. 1965. It's not the oldest cache paper. I'm going to give you the older reference. So spatial locality is also very fundamental. Uh, basically, uh, this means that nearby data will be accessed soon. If you're accessing this data, data nearby will be accessed soon if you organize your data well or if your access patterns are like that. Uh, so you store the address adjacent to the recently accessed one in automatically managed fast memory. You logically divide memory into equal size blocks and fetch to cache the access block, not just the word that you need, but the block that's around it. Uh, that's a spatial locality principle. It happens because programs have this behavior, essentially, that, spa uh, that, uh, that expose spatial locality. And this is what IBM, uh, this is actually due to IBM. It's not Maurice Wilkes talked about words. IBM talked about blocks. And IBM 36085 is, was the first, at least written, processor that Im uh, implemented uh, large blocks. And this is another beautiful paper that talks about the trade-offs that they examined. We'll talk about manual and automatic management. So caches, when we talk about, pr uh, uh, are automatic. Hardware manages data movement across levels transparently to the program. It has benefits. This also has benefits if the programmer knows what they're doing really well. That's, that's a manual management. Uh, but it's too painful for programs, uh, programmers on substantial programs. If you actually know your program, if, you're, if you can expose locality very well, then you, you may be able to do this well. So actually, old uh, memories were like this, core versus drum memories in the 1950s. It's still done in embedded processors on chip scratch pad. It's still on GPUs, for example. The shared memory in GPUs uh, are, uh, are actually uh, scratch pads. Automatic programmer's life is easier. That's the big benefit. Uh, but, uh, and the average programmer doesn't need to know about it. You can have simple heuristics. But if you want to have a fast program over here, now you don't become automatic anymore. Now you have to know something about your caches. So this is a, another fundamental thing, manual versus automatic management, and how do you draw the line? How do you provide interfaces such that uh, the not so experienced programmers can ignore what's happening in the system and still get good performance, but the really experienced programmers can go into it and actually uh, make things uh, much faster. So you really need a good uh, uh, way of catering to both needs, I think, somehow. I think that's true for general purpose processors as well as accelerators, too, because accelerators are going to be everywhere in the system. It's not going to be something that's programmed by just a few sm uh, small number of people. It's going to be programmed by many people. Okay, uh, more on automatic management. This is actually really interesting. Uh, by a slave memory, I mean one which automatically accumulates to itself words that come from a slower main memory. This, uh, this is a paper that I would recommend. And there are actually other cache papers. Uh, if you're interested in the history uh, of computing, these two papers are the oldest that I could find. This is talking about caching from the context of a system. Uh, but this one is really 
really the first paper uh, for that proposed a hardware cache. If you're interested in that, uh, it's it's from the National Cache Register Company (NCR) at that time, uh, and this is the cache that they actually designed. Basically, this is the, they called it the Luca site. This is the data storage. This is the tag storage, and there are some bits that enable your access. And this is your main memory at the time. And this is 1962. Okay, this is 2018. We still look the same. Well, maybe a little bit more complicated, right? There are a lot more levels right now. Register file. This is the modern memory hierarchy that we have today. And you should probably question, should we really look the same uh, going forward? 62, 2018, that's 56 years. And some people argue that they've invented the caches, but they haven't produced documentation yet uh, on that. So we'll see. Okay, let's talk about DRAM in the remaining amount of time, which is about five minutes. I may be over just one or two minutes, if you allow me to. We start a bit late. Uh, okay, but I think this is important to know for the later lecture. So DRAM subsystem looks like this. You have different granularities. You, uh, I'm going to start uh, uh, at different granularities. Let's start with the bottom over here. Modern DRAM has two DRA of cells, rows and columns. A DRAM row is also called a DRAM page. It's an unfortunate terminology. I'm going to call it a DRAM row as much as possible. Sense amplifiers are also called the row buffer. Each address is a row column pair. If you want to access a closed row, you need to activate and the entire row, as we've said before. It places data into the row buffer. And it's a, you, you have read-write commands. Uh, they read and write columns in the row buffer. And then if you want to access a different row, you need to first pre-charge the array. It closes the row and prepares the array for the next access by basically uh, putting the bit lines in a state where you can sense data uh, from the next access. If you access an open row, open row means a row is already in the row buffer in DRAM. There's no need for the activate command, basically. You can directly go and read. And clearly, there's no need for the pre-charge command in that case also. This is my cartoonish picture of a DRAM bank. You can look at it on your own. Uh, it's actually a nice picture. Oh, why is this not looking very well? I think there's some, some issue with this VGA over here. This normally looks well. But basically, this is, let's go through the operation a little bit. This is the row buffer. This is 2D, two-dimensional array of columns and rows. Row buffer is initially empty. Let's assume that you want to access row 0, column 0. What do you need to do? The memory controller first needs to send row address, activate row 0. DRAM chip activates row 0, brings the data into the row buffer. Then uh, it's, you, the memory controller sends the column address to do a read. Uh, column address 0 gets sent uh, and the, with a read command. And the memory chip sends column 0 to the memory controller. That's how you access row 0, column 0. Let's assume the next access goes to row 0, column 1. Now the memory controller says, oh, row 0 is already in the row buffer. I'm not going to open the row again because it's already open. This is called a row buffer hit. I'm just going to send column address 1 and a read command. And you get the column address 1 out of the DRAM chip. And if the next access is the same row again, the same thing happens. It's a row buffer hit. And you get column address 85. Now, if the next access is to a different row, now this is slow access. The memory controller says, oh, row 0 is open here, but I want row 1. So I'm first going to pre-charge the array because it's a row buffer conflict. It takes time to pre-charge the array. You get rid of the row. Then you send the new row address. It gets decoded. You activate row 1. That's the activate command. And then uh, the memory controller sends the column address with a read. And then you get the data back. So clearly, this row buffer conflict took a long time compared to row buffer hits. Right? The DRAM chip consists of multiple banks. 8 is a common number today, but it's increasing. It's about 16 and uh, later chips. Banks share the command address and data buses. The chip itself is a narrow interface to minimize cost. A lot of these decisions are made because of cost. Because if you have only 4 to 16 bits, uh, you have only 4 to 16 pins, and that minimizes your cost when you're manufacturing a chip. Uh, changing the number of banks, size of the interface, whether or not uh, you have uh, shared or uh, isolated uh, partition command address data buses have significant impact on DRAM system costs. We're not going to go into a lot of the details uh, of this, but there's a lot to do here. I don't know why this doesn't look good, but if you download the slides, this will look good, I guarantee you. Uh, this is an internals of a DRAM chip. You can take a look at it. Uh, it actually is very interesting. I like this one uh, uh, because it, it shows you exactly all of these banks and these refresh mechanisms, bank control logic, column address, column decoders, dot, dot, dot. OK, so because your interface is very small, 4 to 16 bits, you need multiple chips. And you, we operate them together to form a wide interface today. All chips comprising a rank that's like a rank of soldiers responding to a single command. You give the activate command to all of them, and they respond to a single command. And they share the address and command buses, but provide different data. Uh, and a DRAM module consists of one or more ranks. This is called dual inline memory module, for example. This is what you plug into your motherboard. 
So for example, if you have chips with an 8-bit interface, they can provide 8-bit of data. If you want to get 8 bytes in a single access, you need to use 8 chips in a DIMM. And it looks like this, basically. These are the 8 chips. And you send them a command, and you get 8 bits from each of them. As a result, in one cycle, you get 8 times 8 bits, right? 64 bits. And if you want to read a 64-byte cache line, you do this in one cycle, and the next seven cycles, you get the remaining 56, uh, 56 bytes, right? In one cycle, you get eight, uh, 8 bytes. OK, again, this is not looking good. We need to solve this problem somehow. But OK, this is the DIMM. Uh, in my, uh, and if you're interested, this uh, paper actually has the uh, picture uh, in high quality. This acts like a high capacity DRAM chip with a wide interface now. And you get flexibility because now memory controller doesn't need to deal with individual chips. That's the benefit of a DIMM. The disadvantage of granularity. If you want to access only 8 bytes, too bad. Your interface has become, well, if you want to access 1 byte, 8 bits, your interface be has become 64 bits. So you lose some flexibility uh, in the system. OK, if you want to put more memory into the system, you add multiple DIMMs. This is an ugly picture, but that's OK. You add some interconnect, basically, and you need to control that interconnect somehow. As a result, you can put more DIMMs into your machine. It enables even higher capacity. The problem is interconnect complexity and energy consumption can grow significantly. And this is a single channel in this case. If you want to add more capacity, you could add multiple channels. But then you need to have more pins from the CPU chip over here, or whatever chip you have on this side. So scalability is really limited by your interconnect complexity. We will see that a lot of the issues actually in the end boil down to interconnect. There was this debate about 16 years ago, I think, in one of the HPCA conferences. Is it about the interconnect or is it about the memory? Nobody talked about computation, gladly. <laughs> but basically, it's really intertwined with each other. Interconnect and memory. We'll talk about latency a lot. Latency is a lot about the interconnect. And complexity is all about the interconnect also. So it's really important to know the interconnects. Uh, okay, DRAM channels, these are, in this case, you have two independent channels, one memory controller over here, another memory controller, they're controlling separate DIMMs, essentially. That's it. Uh, and usually they're independent channels, I'm not going to talk about this. So you can actually look at this paper for more detail. This is a generalized memory structure, you basically have two memory controllers controlling two memory channels, you have a bunch of DIMMs, as you can see over here, and each DIMM has a bunch of DRAM chips, so these, uh, and you can have a rank within a DIMM. And if you look over here, each, each of the uh, chips is consisting of multiple banks over here, and each bank has this two-dimensional structure. So it's beautiful, basically. Uh, and this is the generalized memory structure. I'll recommend a bunch of papers for you to take a look at, but hopefully this is relatively clear. Let me give you the top-down view before we stop for the day. Uh, basically, we're gonna start with the top. At the top, you have a channel, right? That's what's connected to your processing unit. And this is an example processor. It has two memory channels in this case. Each memory channel has two DIMMs, as you can see. So it, this has four DIMMs. And if you look at the DIMM, it has the front and back. And each, uh, each uh, part of the DIMM is a rank. Essentially, this is rank 0. This is rank 1. It's a collection of eight chips over here. And what does the rank mean? Rank means, basically, it's there to increase your memory size. And at any point in time, you can access only one rank. So you can switch between the ranks to do different accesses. And these also share address commands uh, and data buses. But you can only access one of them at a time. You need to switch to the other rank if you want to access the other one, if you have data to access over there. So these all lead to conflicts, as you can see, right? You cannot access the data that you need uh, uh, at the same time if, if the data happens to be in both ranks. So you need to map your data intelligently. If you break down the rank, the rank consists of eight chips in this case, as I said. Uh, each of them provide eight bits of data, so you get 64 bits of data in the end. And if you break down the chip, the chip consists of, in this case, eight banks. As you can see, banks can be accessed in parallel. There's a MUX that determines which bank is providing the data at this point in time. This provides you parallelism. Channels provide you parallelism. Banks also provide you parallelism over here. And if you break down the bank, a single bank consists of two-dimensional array of uh, cells. And as you can see, rows and columns. And uh, yeah. I think we've already discussed this over here. Let me give you the, uh, how, we, how we transfer a cache block, and then we'll be done. Uh, basically, if you look at your physical memory address space, you want to read the 64-byte cache block. It turns out it's mapped to a single rank over here. It would be terrible if it's mapped to two ranks, right? because you cannot access both ranks at the same time. Uh, so you, we usually put it into a single rank. And you get basically uh, eight bits out of each access uh, from the different chips. So in the first access, first burst, you get the first eight bytes, right? In the next one, you get the next eight bytes. In the next one, you get the next eight bytes, dot, dot, dot. Which means that a 64-byte cache block takes eight I.O. cycles to transfer. During the process, eight columns are read sequentially. 
in this case. So there are a bunch of latency components, which we may uh, start with next time, but I think I'll stop over here. Uh, and then we'll start with either the basics or the next step, depending on uh, what I think. But I would, uh, regardless, I would recommend that you go over some of the basics uh, of memory, because it's useful regardless, right? Even if you're not going to be working on memory for a while, this is good to know, because it may affect something else that you're doing in the CPU, for example. Any burning questions? Okay, I guess we'll continue from here tomorrow. Thanks.